Hello everybody, welcome to the second series of the Chicago Dialogues <coughs> and this is the inaugural episode of the second series. I am Deepesh Chakravarti. I am currently the faculty director of the University of Chicago Center in Delhi and this series as was last year is being <coughs> run in collaboration with Prohor.in. Uh, it is my extreme honor and privilege to uh, introduce to you very briefly my esteemed colleague Muzaffar Alam, whom we are featuring in this episode and who will be in conversation with none other than Abhik Chanda, uh, the, <coughs> the, the writer of a best selling book on Dara Shuko, a multi talented person who was the anchor for this series last year and will be anchoring the series this year again. We are wonderfully happy to have Abhik with us back uh, conducting the series. Uh, Abhik will actually introduce Muzaffar Alam in more detail than I will, but let me simply uh, share with you some impressions that I've had with Professor Alam's uh, work and life and uh, my impressions of him as a, as, a, as a partner in thinking about both modern and pre-modern South Asia. <clears throat> Muzaffar Alam is today, I think, the doyen of Mughal history among, uh, I would say, among non-retired historians. They're still if unhappy, even, but, but Muzaffar's teachers are, are either sadly gone or retired. And I think Muzaffar is easily uh, the most important uh, or at least one of the most important historians of Mughal India, historians of Muslim India, and actually historians of Islam in India. And when I think of Muzaffar's life and work, it seems to me, as his colleague, his friend, somebody who is engaged in conversation with him, that his lifelong quest has been to understand, or one of his lifelong quests has been to understand what happened to Islam after it came to South Asia. Did Islam remain the universalist, Sharia-oriented creed that it always was, has been? Or did the land and its culture and its traditions have a profound influence on Islam as it developed and found itself in the subcontinent? Did Islam engage in a conversation, in a civilizational conversation? with what existed in South Asia, with South Asia civilizational, even the pre-Islamic civilizational heritage. And that profound question has led Professor Alam, or my friend Muzaffar, um, to particularly to examine Sufi text. And one big transition, I think, in Professor Alam's career or training, or in the arc of his work, where I find it, is actually the transition from having been trained in the old Alligar school of political and economic history and uh, having been trained that way but then refashioning himself into a, a historian of culture, of political ideas and <coughs> profoundly interested in what, uh, what, this, what an Indic version of Islam or an Indian Islam contributed uh, to not only politics, but even to the development of political thought in pre-British India. And he's very careful in his book, this book and also the book on political Islam, to actually look at Sufism not simply kind of as a fixed set of doctrine, but rather as evolving set of thoughts and to distinguish 19th century Sufi thinking, for instance, um, from what preceded Sufi thought. And the new book is very much engaged in that historian's enterprise of actually showing us how, what would Sufism look like if we were not too influenced by 19th century perceptions of Sufism. But this profound lifelong quest of Muzaffar Adams about understanding Islam in the South Asian context. And he joins some very respectable uh, line of intellectuals in asking that question. 
This profound lifelong interest has now culminated in the book we are discussing today, The Mughals and the Sufis, Islam and Political uh, Imagination in India, 1500 to 1750. Uh, and I'm delighted that Abhik, a tremendous interest in Muslim India, in Mughal India, is here to engage in this conversation with Professor Alam. I have absolutely no doubt that this will be a feast of ideas uh, that we will all enjoy. Welcome to you again to the first inaugural episode and over to you, Abhik. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dipesha. I think there might be a little bit of a technical glitch. I don't see Professor Alam. So perhaps if you would give oh. me another minute while you, you know, continue your, your observation sure. or, or your, your thoughts around Professor, I'll just call him up and see where he's going, right? Thank you. Sure. Oh, okay. So we have this, yeah, technical problem. But, um, well, I was just going to say that... Um, <clears throat> that in this series actually going forward, we have, uh, so we've changed it somewhat from last year's. We will have, uh, of course, we will be showcasing work that is done by Chicago faculty. But we've also decided to uh, present conversations between Chicago faculty and scholars, intellectuals, uh, eminent personalities we consider friends of uh, the University of Chicago. So we will have uh, <coughs> soon an episode uh, featuring David Shulman, the great Indologist, uh, who is based in Israel, but who has long-term connections with Chicago. Uh, the other person who we will be featuring is also Jerry Rao. Jerry is an entrepreneur who is based, works out of Bombay and, and Bengaluru, but who is also an intellectual and has <coughs> produced um, Two books, two interesting books. One that he calls um, uh, The Indian Conservative. It's a kind of manifesto of um, philosophical political conservatism. Very interesting, thought provoking, provoking, and even a provocative book. And we'll be engaging Jerry in a conversation about that book, as well as another book he's written on <coughs> more recently on Gandhian economics. Uh, both very interesting books. And Jerry's, of course, had long connections with Chicago. He was a student in our business school. He has served on the board of trustees for the uh, center in Delhi, uh, and has generally been uh, a friend and a well-wisher of the university. And the other person we would also feature is actually the very well-known famous anthropologist and social theorist, Arjuna Padurai. Uh, Arjun uh, did his PhD from Chicago, taught in Chicago before he left Chicago for Yale and then the New School and then the then NYU, the New York University. But we will be talking about Arjun's life and work uh, later on in this series. Uh, again, a conversation about his work. But we'll also, alongside these people whom I've categorized as friends of Chicago, We'll also be featuring um, people who are on, on, on our faculty um, and who has an interesting, very interesting work. There is a <clears throat> fascinating and a very well known uh, uh, pediatrician we have on our faculty who does surgery on little babies on, uh, on urological problems and who is a pioneer of robotic surgery. And, um, who is also somebody who is engaged in uh, taking this technology to South Asia. He's, he's from South Asia, uh, Professor Mohan Gundeti. Uh, we'll be talking about his work. So there are a lot of interesting programs coming ahead. Um, I'm sorry about the technical glitch we seem to be having. Uh, so I will um, take myself off the screen at this point, and uh, ask for your patience and ask for, and I'm sure Abhik will advise as soon as to what's happening. And um, if you so, so, so Dipesda, Dipesda, thanks for holding the fort. Uh, I've been just been talking to Professor Alam. There seems to be a glitch with his Wi Fi. 
So uh, what he's probably going to oh. do is, uh, yeah. So so he's seeing this 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 some glitch. So what he's now doing is he's going to try and connect through his phone because sometimes that just works right through the through the phone connection. So we'll just give it a couple of minutes. Okay. And he's, if he's able to join us, then then well and good. Abhik, while we are waiting for him, do you want to talk a little bit about the book without giving away much about your actual conversation? Sure. Uh, maybe maybe depends. Uh, or, although you know, or the maybe, viewers of the. Maybe, yeah. So I was thinking, Dipesh, that you know, the viewers of of our program need absolutely no sort of new introduction uh, over and above what you've already said. But maybe I'll just add to what you said earlier when you introduced Professor Adam by mentioning some of his uh, you know classic landmark books, right? Uh, so, for example, his major publications include The Crisis of Empire in Mughal North India. Also, the Languages of Political Islam in India, twelve hundred to eighteen hundred, which you were referring to, Dipesh. Together with the several books that he has co-written with other scholars, for example, the celebrated book with with Sima Alavi, a uh, European experience of the Mughal Orient, and the many books, the many celebrated books that he has co-authored together with Sanjay Subramanian, for example, the Mughal State, 1526 to 1750, then writing the Mughal world, and last but not the least, there's also Indo-Persian travels in the age of discovery, 1400 to 1800. And of course, the the whole I emphasis. Actually, no, I, I was just going to before I sign off. I was just going to say that, see, Muzaffar and Sanjay um, together, but also Muzaffar's his own scholarship. I mean, they've been instrumental in changing the nature of, nature of Mughal history. Yeah, and uh, I will be listening I'm with sorry. a lot of interest to your conversation. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mister. All right. So. Uh, Viewers, sorry about the technical glitch and uh, a very, very warm welcome to you to the okay. inaugural episode, the first episode of, of season two. And it's, of course, very befitting that this should feature, you know, one of the world's most accomplished, easily the world's most learned today. And, of course, one of the world's most well-loved of medieval historians, uh, Professor Muzaffar Alam Sab. Uh, Muzaffar Ji, Adab, and a very warm welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, my problem, internet problem, it has, I had never experienced this. In fact, you know, for a moment or for a minute, it would. It has happened in the past, but nothing like that. I'm still trying and my laptop is not getting. Connected. No, that's 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 fine. Muzaffarji, what I would suggest is uh, let's leave the laptop aside and let's just continue our discussion like this. This is fine. This is absolutely fine. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Great. So, uh, Muzaffarji, in, in terms of the of the discussion uh, of your book, of your recent book, The Mughals and the Sufis, Islam and Political Imagination in India, 1500 to 1750, which was published very recently to, to great acclaim. Why don't we perhaps get started with some of the popular notions or maybe stereotypes about the Sufis in India and the relationship to, to the monarchs? And uh, for example, there's this frequent, there's this notion that the Sufis were were Aztecs. They were saintly, otherworldly beings who had absolutely no interest and completely shied away from anything to do with politics whatsoever. Right. So perhaps we begin with that and and share with us what your findings, what your research reveals. Thank you, or uh, for my being a little unnerved because of the internet connection. Yeah, I think that. Even today, uh, many of our friends, including scholars, think that the Sufis' primary concern is the other world. Yes, primary concern is the other world. And I also think that if you consider the doctrinal discourses of the Sufis, they are discussing, you will find them discussing what, in fact, they would use the term tazkiyah nafs, that is purification of the soul, purifications of, of the heart, and much more sophisticated, much higher than that would be that their concern is not simply the life hereafter in the sense of Jannah or Jahannam, hell or heaven, but it is in fact the communion with Allah, communion with God. That is what Sufism is. And therefore, any concern with this worldly phenomena 
everyday life, normal life, including politics of the court, simply pollutes piety. Because the aim is, the goal is piety, so it pollutes piety. And, but I would not say that all scholars, in fact, have gone or believe, in fact, the same. Many of my scholars, my, my friends, and I would mention Simon Digby, for instance, he was one of the first. And he, around the same time, Aziz Ahmad, the author of the well-known book, he studies in Islamic environment in, in a Indian Islam in Indian environment, Islamic studies in Indian environment, and our own very close friend who recently left us, Sunil Kumar. They did acknowledge, in fact, the Sufis' participations in politics, but in fact, the initiative in the particip in parties in their participation in politics did not come from the Sufis. They were, in fact, forced to come, which also, on occasions, in fact, on many occasions, resulted in conflicts between the Sultan or the noble and, and the Sufis. They were forced to come. They were not, they were reluctant. What I have done and where I think that I'm, I would not say that this is in my invention or innovation, but I'm reasonably, in fact, different from my uh, other friends and colleagues is that Sufis here, I do not present the Sufis as passive receivers only. Their involvement in politics is very much active. As the Sultans, the kings had their politics, their understanding of the statecraft, political management. So the Sufis also had their own understanding of politics. And it is, in fact, the relationship between the two, the, the interaction between the two, the Sufis' politics and the king's and the court politics or secular elite's politics that I have tried to understand. This is the difference. The king and the Sufis are in a sort of, in a sort of, I would say this, the, if I am allowed to use this expression, in a sort of competition of power, competition of in a competition of power, even in this world. And sometimes you will see in my you know, book that the Sufi is more powerful. And sometimes, of course, most of the time, the king would dominate, the king would try to dictate, but the Sufi would not, would refuse to be dictated. The Sufi will, it will have their own strategy. This is what, in fact, the difference in my approach is uh, from my even those colleagues who have shown the Sufis taking part in politics. So this is how I would respond to. Great. Yeah. Uh, and, and if we talk about the entire trajectory of you know the Mughal emperors, from for instance Babur all the way to Aurangzeb, another preconceived notion is that you know there's there's almost like a, a monolithic allegiance up until the time of Aurangzeb as if all Mughal sultans were automatically, they, they swore allegiance to the, the Chistis or the Chisti Sabri. Uh, in, in your you know, research, as you see the trajectory, not just maybe Babur, but even pre-Babur during the Timurid times, and the kind of allegiance and the kind of association they had to the different silsilas or sects of the Sufi through the ages, what did your book find in this regard? Yeah, in terms of, yeah, but it's a good question. And in terms of details and also the approach, the Mughals inherited a deeply rooted relationship with Sufis from their forebears. And the Mughals also saw the relationship between one set of the Sufis and the rulers whom they had overcome, whom they had defeated, the rulers, I mean, the Lodi king. Uh, coming, going back to Central Asia, from where the Mughals came, Babur's father was very close to one of the major 15th century Sufi, Naqshbandi Sufi, Khaja Ubaidullah Ahrar. In fact, from him, we also have a branch in Naqshbandi, as we have a branch 
in India from Sheikh Ahmad Sarandi. We'll come to him later. Babar, when Babar was born, in fact, he was brought to his lap. He was there, in fact, in the palace with uh, in, in Babar's father's, in fact, kingly palace, Umar Shaykh Mirza. And he suggested the name Zahiruddin Muhammad Babar. Zahiruddin Muhammad. But since he thought that, and since uh, this is how Abul Fazl reports uh, in Akbar Nama, that since the Chaktais were not, in fact, sophisticated <laughs> enough to pronounce the Arbisai's name, Arbisai's name so adequately, therefore, there was given also a short name, a short, you know, Uzbek, Persho, Uzbek, Persho, Central Asian name that is Babar. And we know, of course. And Babar did not, in fact, uh, appropriate any other title when he mm -hmm. declared when he was king he called himself Muhammad Zahiruddin Babar you know as you have in fact in the case of even earlier sultans that when in Tukmish comes to power he acquired a title of Shamsuddin or when yes. Balban comes to power he acquires the title of 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 uh, uh, Balban is uh, what I mean I think uh, Yes, Jala, no, Jalaluddin Akbar. But at any rate, Islamic name with the Turkish name. Here, in fact, yes. Babar has the same name. Now, Babar had a strong relationship. One of the expressions could be of, of the manifestation could be that, you know, all the Timurid princes dreamt to control Samarkand because Samarkand was the center of Timur and Timurid princes had this ambition. Babar also mm -hmm. had this ambition, but he failed there. But whenever he would, of course, uh, plan to, he will have in dream Khadija Abadullah Harar, because by the time Babar grew, Khadija Abadullah had died. And yes. much more important is that he failed there, of course, but when he came over to India, when he defeated, in the battle of Panipat also, he had the vision of his master, that is his, the Timurid master, and his disciple as well, Nakhmandi Sufi. You know, in between his relationship with his, you know, uh, with his ancestors, uh, Sufi masters had strained a bit because of his being close to Shah Tahmas Safavi, but then he repented and he came back to the fold of the same Central Asian Mawara Nahri Nakhbandi Shayukh Nakhbandi peace. And you know, he this is what is described Babar, and then Bab this, of course, is not given in Babar Nama. But in Babar Nama, this is interesting to note that when he is taken ill, he believes that if he versifies Khwaja Abdullah Ehrar's uh, treatise, uh, a, he would recover. And he says that the the more he would, uh, every day that he would, you know, uh, versify or translate uh, into um, the Khwaja Abdullah Ehrar's treatise, and uh, the more he will be, uh, if, will feel better. So that is one. And and then it is also reported, and this, of course, Babar himself mentions, and Abul Fazal also mentioned, that he invited his master, that is Central Asian master, Khadija Abdullah Harar's descendants to India. That is a kind of, you know, combined power. You know, he has established a new Timurid kingdom in mm -hmm. India, and in this Timurid kingdom, there will be also a share of the Harari Nakhbandi Shuyu. But unfortunately, we know that Babar died. And, and Humayun, uh, let's now go to Humayun. Humayun also had, of course, fascination for Sufism, but he became close to the Indian Sufi Shattaris because he was interested in astrological and astronomical uh, features. I mean, those who are interested, they can read, in fact, in Kanun e Humayun, his interest. And, and therefore, and the Shattari also, amongst the prayers of the major parts of the prayers of Shattari were Dua'i, Dawati Asma'i Hasana, which in fact imply the control of the, of the uh, heavenly uh, bodies and the stars. And, but of course, I, I, I'm not interested in those details. But so because of this, he became close to the Shattaris. And because of this, he became indifferent to those descendants of Khadija Abdullah Harar, who had come, and they became, in fact, you know, disgusted, and they left back. They left for Samarkand, and this is considered, in fact, by none other than one of his own cousins, 
Mirza Haider Doglat that this became the cause of Humayun's defeat at the hands of the Afghans. Mm -hmm. So this you can see, in fact, the nature yes. of the interaction and relationship. And then when you come to Akbar, it is so evident because Akbar had his own vision of kingship. Akbar wanted to, in fact, appreciate the local because of the because of, he grew. In fact, when he came to power, he was a young man. And then for some reasons, and we um, I think we all know the details, he became connected matrimonially with one of the local important uh, kingly families, Rajputs uh, of Amir, uh, later Jaipur. And, uh, and, and so you have for the first time in a very, uh, in a very organized manner, not for the first time, even Il Tutmish had in fact, a local uh, Hindu princess as his queen. But here you have in a different, I would not go into the details of the nature of the, of the matrimonial relationship that the Mughals established and, and the significance of this relationship that it is on equal, equal footing. It is not that the conquerors brings the conquished peoples or the vanquished peoples princes to, 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 his, uh, to his haram. It is actually matrimonial. A relationship with due respect to each other's traditions. So, you know, all these conditions, in fact, you know, convinced him <coughs> of in considering a kind of a pattern of governance which would ensure closer relationship of the different, in fact, localities and different powers in the localities into Mughal Empire. This was a part, of course, his way of the building of, of, of the empire, imperial power. And this with this vision there was difficult for him he found it difficult to reconcile with the naqshbandi ahrari central asian naqshbandi idea of 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 no concern for the or in, even even opposition to the rusume biganagan the customary practices of the others you know there is no in fact compromise on this question that if you want to become a good Muslim, you mm -hmm. cannot, in fact, you should not take into account the cultural and social practices of the others. Otherwise, it will, in fact, affect the level of your own, your, your own faith, your own Iman, your own Islam. Now, this was difficult. So therefore, and then luckily, therefore, he, you know, you find that he is building relationship with the Chishtis amongst the manifestations of his relationship would be first, of course, you know, Khaja Salim Chishti uh, of, 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 of Agra, of Fatehapur Tikri. And then you have, in fact, his expressions of his devotion to Khaja Moinuddin Chishti. He would go on foot, visit shrine, the shrine of Khaja Moinuddin Chishti. Yes. And more than that, in fact, uh, his uh, you know his, you know appropriations of 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 uh, several you know chisti uh, chisti practices which in fact flowed from the chisti belief in the doctrine of vadatul wujud that unity of being that unity of being the simply very simplified of course implication would be that you know since we are all one so we can have in fact we can accommodate with each other we can in fact have good relationship with each other. So this is how Akbar came close to, to the Chisti, Chisti saints. And, and here, in fact, I would, I would in fact mention, and I have repeatedly, in fact, I'm very fond of you know, repeating it, that while on the one hand in the Naqshbandi, naturally, then of course, naturally, around the same time, towards the last years of Akbar's time, you have in fact, a new branch of the Naqshbandi, Central Asian Naqshbandi emerging from Serhan and under the leadership of Sheikh Ahmad Sarandi. And you have, in fact, Sheikh Ahmad Sarandi's own image of Mughal power, Sheikh Ahmad Sarandi's own image of, of Akbar and, and the requirements of the politics and, and the nature of his statecraft. So if on the one hand, and what is the result that if on the one hand, in the Naqshbandi Mujaddidi. This branch is called Mujaddidi because yeah. Sheikh yes. Masrandi called himself the renovator of Islam in the second millennium. 
millenarianism. In fact, you know, a kind of millenarianism. If there are any questions, you know, because this millenarianism also affected in a measure uh, Akbar Basha and for that matter, many two other Bashas in the Islamic land. But so Sheikh, in Sheikh Ahmad Sarandi's writings and in Sheikh Ahmad Sarandi's followers writing, if you have the image of Akbar as quote unquote destroyer of Islam, the Islam, destroyer of Islam, it is interesting to note that in the Chisti Taskara, one of the major Chisti Taskara, that is uh, Miratul Asrar, uh, compiled by Sheikh Abdul Rahman Chisti, and I'll come to him later a bit, and if there are questions, yes. much more. Uh, he mentions him as, when, he, when his name figures, of course, besides describing his connections with the Ajmer Shrine and the Chisti Saints, he mentions him as 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 rahimahullah you know god bless him now this kind of formulation formulated prayer is in fact meant for the pious people for the sufis for religious scholars so you can imagine you can imagine the contrast uh, of the image of this the same ruler the same ruler the between and the yes in the two sufi traditions that is something to be noted in fact and, and I'll come to, and after that, in fact, after that, after Akbar uh, in Jahangir's time and in also in Shah Jahan's time, the, the rulers were, and most of the nobles were close to the Chisti primarily. But it does not mean that they, they were not patronizing the Naqshbandis, but they were not patronizing the local Naqshbandi Mujaddidi Sarandi. I'll come to his point when they returned to power spiritual and also political power under Aurangzeb. But during these three rulers, the, 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 the Naqshbandis, in fact, uh, are pushed. Uh, I'm using this. Almost language. marginalized. Almost marginalized. 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 Yes, they're marginalized. And, but the other Naqshbandis, of course, are still, in fact, uh, you know, uh, earning patronage from the Mughal court, from the Mughal nobles, like the Dehbedi, you know, Santilation Naqshbandi. They be the, in fact, a major branch of Naqshbandi, whom we generally forget, was there in, in Kashmir. So the Kashmiri Naqshbandis, and later also uh, another branch which came up in, in Aurangabad, the Aurangabad, you know, they are all in contact with the Mughals and the Mughal nobles uh, because of their own, in fact, uh, sh having shared the same homeland, you know, you have. But the Naqshbandi Mujaddidi, you know, are, you know, they are almost alienated from the court during the time of uh, Akbar, Jahangir, Shah Jahan. We know that Jahangir, in fact, imprisoned Sheikh Ahmad Mujaddidi. And that, in fact, he uses a very strong word for Sheikh Ahmad Sarandi in his memoir, Preposterous Claim. And this is, of course, a theological debate. Uh, Sheikh Ahmad Sarandi has his own self-image as a Sufi. And this self-image was not acceptable even to the Muslim religious scholars of his time. And as there, they protested. And in response to their protest, Jahagir actually imprisoned, imprisoned Sheikh Masarandi. But within a year, in fact, he was released. And he stayed for some time at the court. But he didn't, of course, he stayed. Perhaps he would not have felt uncomfortable. Uh, and perhaps he would not have. Uh, felt that you know he had to compete with the other two uh, sufis at the court <laughs> so he left for so but so this is this is uh, but in then you come to aurangzeb's time in terms of details aurangzeb in fact it is difficult for me to say that aurangzeb uh, became uh, a disciple of naqshbandi uh, saint uh, in his time Sheikh Ahmad Sarandi's son, Sheikh Masum Sarandi, was the major, in fact, leader of the Sarandi uh, Sufis, Sarandi saints. And we have, but we do have evidence of correspondence, not from, of course, the emperor's side. We do not have any letter from Aurangzeb to them, but you have several letters from Sheikh, Mas Sheikh Masum Sarandi to Aurangzeb and his brother who uh, died in. Uh, in 1661, Sheikh Muhammad Said Sarandi, you know, their letters to Aurangzeb. And 
their instructions and uh, exhortations for the things that Aurangzeb should do in order to re-establish uh, Islam, you know, Islam. in the sense of you know the kind of the Islam that they thought. That they and but you do have we do not have enough evidence. I it will be difficult for me to claim that we have evidence of Aurangzeb's having been completely integrated into Naqshbandi order uh, as a disciple. We do not have any evidence like that. But the details that you have, I can suspect. But more important than that is that almost throughout Aurangzeb's time, you have one or the other member of the Naqshbandi, Sarandi, Mujaddidi family at the court. And one of the major, in fact, third uh, Naqshbandi saint leader of the family, Khwaja Muhammad Naqshband, in fact, is reported to be there during the time of Aurangzeb's expedition, military expeditions against uh, Golconda regime. And I have, in fact, given interesting details. In fact, it's slightly funny also, uh, because this is described by one of the major poets, poets of the time, Nehmat Khan Ali. And he, in fact, describes the claims of the Naqshbandi uh, Sheikh, Khwaja Muhammad Naqshband, and also the nature of his you know, influence on, uh, on Aurangzeb rather, you know, uh, sarcastically. So, so, so that, that you have. And, you know, the second, in fact, interesting, and uh, perhaps I would say uh, indisputable evidence of Aurangzeb's close connections with, uh, with the Naqshbandi family uh, is that uh, what, in fact, our Sunni Kumar Chatterjee in one of his articles which is, of course, philological primarily relating to language and linguistics, you know, describes that one of one of our uh, Bengal fellow who who had heard about Aurangzeb's, in fact, concern with religion and religiosity. And he had come all the way from Bengal to the Deccan uh, when, they, they, of course, during this time in the 80s, Aurangzeb was already in the Deccan fighting yes. against the Marathas and also the so uh, and he wanted to become murid of 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 of, of uh, Aurangzeb, and Aurangzeb, of course, when he was uh, brought to the court, uh, Aurangzeb smiled and he said that I am just an ordinary person, and my concern is primarily secular and political. That is this worldly, and take him to Muhammad Nafe Sahib. So unfortunately, we do not have anywhere else this name except in. In Masri Alam Group, that's the political crime. It's not yes. the Nakhbandi Taskera. And so that shows, and in fact, there the primary interest of uh, Suniti Kumar Chatterjee is that Aurangzeb was familiar with Hindi and with Sanskrit. Uh, and he mentioned a couple of things, which, if you are interested, and if anyone of uh, my friends is interested, can read it. He, because he thinks that Aurangzeb also knew. Uh, Sanskrit and Aurangzeb certainly knew very good Hindi, and uh, that is clear. He would prefer, in fact, to speak Hindi, and in Hindi means whatever the form of Hindi in the 17th century. But uh, you know, uh, he and I am reminded of, and I would mention this that uh, one of the one of the uh, varieties of mango that Aurangzeb liked very much, he called it Sudharas. Sudharas. Yes. So, you know, Suniti Babu, in fact, suggests that nobody can think of such a beautiful, you know, name uh, uh, unless he knows or he has they have a, a deep, of, yes, a deep of, knowledge, a deep, yeah. not just a working knowledge, but a deep knowledge of the yeah. language. Uh, so, Rati, is, fact, you know, so this is what the yeah. Naqsabandi Mojadidi came back to the court mm -hmm. in Aurangzeb's time. And, uh, and, and of course, there are several manifestations of they are coming back to the court and a kind of competition between the Naqshbandi, Mujaddidi and the Chishtis. And I will come to it later. Perhaps there could be also a question I see here from yes. you. So I think this is what I would say for the moment. Uh, so, so Muzaffarji, staying with Aurangzeb for a minute, regardless of whether he was a true disciple or truly swayed by the Naqshbandi order and their philosophy, or whether he portrayed this allegiance for his political 
reasons, right, uh, for, for his own stakes uh, uh, in, in, in the kingdom, in the empire. One of the things is, is undisputed, and you've pointed this out uh, in your book, is that his aversion, so Aurangzeb, you know, is, is brought up in a milieu where there is music. There is definitely music in the court of Shah Jahan. But when he comes to power as the emperor Alamgir, there is a, a dictum against music or against Sama. And this, this reaches beyond the confines of the court, even to the silsilas or even to the khankas in, in the, the various orders. And there is this particular, I think, very telling, very dramatic incident that you have recounted in your book, where there's a particular silsila, right? And you have the Maltasev who orders them to stop the musical performance. And after that, you know, the, what happens? So it'd be great if you can share that with, with us, with the viewers. Yeah, that's a very interesting story. And this comes out, of course, from the uh, from the Sufi Taskara. And uh, I would not take much time. In fact, I will read out the passage from from my uh, book. It's a long passage, but it, which would be of interest in it. The background is this, that uh, during the time of Urs, that is the births or the death celebrations of the saint, Khwaja Bakhtiar Kaki, Khaja Bakhtiar Kaki, uh, who is buried in Mehroli uh, in Delhi. One of the major Chishti saints of the time who lived and who was very closely connected with Sheikh Abdul Quddus Gangohi. In fact, I should have mentioned that how relationship of the Mughals, in fact, shifted from a kind of rivalry or conflict between the Chishti and so. I'll come to this if there is any question. So one of his descendants, he would come on the occasion of the of of the Urs celebration of Bakhtiar Kaki to Delhi, and he will organize Sama, that is Kawali, you know, this yes. music uh, audition party, which is in fact, you know, uh, which is allowed in Chishtis, in fact, which is considered to be in fact a major a spiritual, you know practice while this is completely banned there is no of course in the 18th century there are flexibilities and yes. accommodations that's a different question but you know in the Nakhbandi Mujaddidi traditions there is no permissions for sama for audition party for music so so this is he would come and this Sufi his name is Khwaja Garibullah now Khwaja Garibullah he he, he figures in fact, in the Sufi Taskara, and I give you the story from Savate Ola Anwar, which is, of course, a major Chishti Taskara of the late 17th century, around 86, 87, it was compiled. So he would come and he had from the time of Shaja. So he had met Shaja and he had also met Dara Shuko, and he did not have any trouble. He would, in fact, be welcome and he would organize and sponsor this audition party and after the you know completion of the celebrations the ceremony of uh, Haja Bakhtiar Kaki's works he'll go back this was the routine but what happened that in Aurangzeb's time you have now a new institutions of Mohtasib that is a kind of Darwa a police yes. officer who would take care of the extent of your adherence to Sharia so that is that was the role of the Mahatasim. And you know, from the text, this text that I'm you know citing uh, from to you, it appears that this Muhtasib around this time, you know, this is in the 70s. You know, the story relates sometimes around the 70s. 70s means the 70s of 16, 17, 70, 16, yes. 16, 76, 77, 75. It's the exact year is not given. Now, so the Mohtasib, in fact, is identified as Pir Zada. Mm -hmm. Whosoever is Mohtasib, he is a Pir Zada. That is, he comes from an important Sufi family. Now, right. no Pir Zada, Chishti Pir Zada, you can imagine to be Mohtasib. Chishti, of course, allow you to be. You know, no Qadri, because by this time, the Qadri Sufis are also fairly, in fact, widespread. Kadri yes. order. So Kadri, would, Sabri, they would not uh, partake of this. And I would assume, in fact, this 
you know, Muhtasib must be a Pirzada from Sarandi family. And in fact, I'll give you also one, you know, very stretched sort of evidence for my speculation. Now, what happens that he was reported that the same Khaja Garibullah, he has come now and he has organized this audition party. Of course, it was in his understanding against the Sharia, against uh, it was violation of Sharia. So therefore, he sent a message that you stop this audition party no longer. It will be allowed here in, in this city, in Delhi, yes. because Mehroli is a part of Delhi. So, but of course, you know, the Sufi, he had come all the way from Saharanpur area, Gango area. Uh, and so it would not be stopped. But then he threatened that I will come and I will force you to stop it. So this message came and the music party was on. And uh, naturally, so, so I will read this. The report then goes that when this Muhtasib, when this Sayyid, that is this fellow, the Sufi, heard of the approach towards the Sama party of that Pirzada Muhtasib, and when he found the other participants having been very panicky amongst his own disciples, so he thought that he should now consult the great master, that is Khaja Bakhtiar Kaki, under whose, in fact, in whose shrine the party was being organized. Yeah. So he sought Bakhtiar Kaki's advice. Thereupon, he saw the saint's grave splitting down the middle and Bakhtiar Kaki himself emerged in red robes, mm -hmm. fire colored red robes, reciting the following verse. I give you the translation. Attired in red colored apparel, he, the beloved, is riding a rapid steed. Be beware, O oh friends, for the fire has risen high. Now, Haribullah took this to mean that. Sheikh Kaki warns him and his followers to resist and come back. Mm -hmm. Totally entranced and inspired with Kaki's message, the Sheikh then stood and he started dancing. You know, that Chisti Sufi also, in fact, yes. Rakh yes. is also precisely with the summer. And in the meanwhile, of course, the Kawals, of course, he asked the Kawals to repeat whatever he was singing. Or and the song was so beautiful that he says, of course, the Chishti, that even the Muhtasib Pirzada, when he came, he was also intoxicated. But at any rate, he forced him to stop. And it was not simply that the party was stopped. He was asked to leave the city. So Garibullah had to leave Delhi. And it is. But even as he left the city, and this is interesting, Yes. He declared that the emperor, because of whom this Muhtasib had the power of stopping the audition party, upon whose instance the Pirzada had acquired so much of power. So he said that the emperor too would be forced to leave Delhi. So it happened. So it was, in fact, this party <laughs> relates to 1675 76. Yes. And it so happened that in by 1980-81, Aurangzeb had to leave Delhi and poor man never returned to Delhi. Never returned. He died. He died there. You know, the, the capital city to capture of which he imprisoned his own father, the capital city to capture or the power in the, the representation of the power is Delhi, of course, Delhi and Agra, to capture of which power of the power for which he kills his own brothers. He, he deceived his own brothers. Forget about Darashuko. Darashuko, yes. of course, was his rival. But even, yes. you know, Murad, Murad Bash, Bash. Poor Murad Bash was not forgiven. Who had? And he promised Murad Bash. The strong to Murad Bash. I was Sufi. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Sufi. I'm a, I'm a, Sufi. I'm a it's primarily a, a religious person. Yes. So that man, he. You know, he dreamt to be back to Delhi, but he never returned to Delhi. He died. He died in the Dakkan. Of course, and this is also, in fact, an irony of the fact that he was buried in the enclosure of a Chishti Sufi there in, in yeah, Kuldabad, yes, yeah. near Aurangabad. Near, so near that, Aurangabad. Is, that is yeah. interesting. And you have such stories of competition. You know, this is, of course, with reference to Mohtasib. There are also, in fact, an, another Qazi 
who wanted to interfere uh, in, uh, in 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 a party of, you know, not here in Delhi city, but uh, sorry, not in Delhi city, but in some other cities. I think it is uh, near a, a town near uh, Karnal and and Panipat, and he too, in fact, suffered and and because of his interference, uh, he his tongue in fact he lost yes he his, becomes mute yeah. he becomes, yes. yes so so you have such so you know what yes. i i'm I, I would like in fact you know i'm reading from such stories the uh, the fact that the fact i'm using the word the fact the fact that even amongst the sufis there is a competition to have political power yes so it's the, in fact this manifestation of holding sama party in delhi and not wanting anybody to interfere in your party means that you have some power in Delhi. You should have some power. And you did not, in fact, you did not approve of interference. That is, so this is what I, I in fact, uh, and I have given such stories in the introduction and also in the footnotes. And yes. this one, of course, is in the main text. Yes, yes, please. indeed. Uh, Muzaffarji, just anecdotally, the last time that we were talking, even the Mothasid, who may have been of the of the Nashpandi denomination, who had forcibly evicted the Qadi, ah, I think yes. even he dies, right? Yes. Even he dies. Yeah, he also died. Uh, and therefore, uh, my suspicion is that this could be Khadija Muhammad Saifuddin, Sheikh Muhammad Saifuddin, Sheikh Muhammad Masum's son, because he died prematurely around the same time. Right. So, so they could be and, one of the same. And, but, and he was very close to Aurangzeb. He was very close to Aurangzeb. In fact, he was deputed by his father, Sheikh Muhammad Masum, to take care of the orders, uh, proper, in fact, arrangement and instructions at the court. And he also, in fact, was given the responsibility to select one of the Arams, uh, one of the princes. I'll come to that, uh, to, to get access uh, into the interior of the royal palace. Yes. So, so this is yes. So, so on that on that note, Muzaffarji, let us maybe you know shift our lens and and go from the the Diwane Am, the Diwane Khas into the into the Zanana. And one of the uh, I think very you know revealing and astute essays that you have in your in your book is to compare from the perspective of religious theological allegiance, particularly with respect to Sufi Silsilas, the two royal imperial princesses who are both daughters and, and uh, Sagi Ben, sisters of each other, Jahanara Begum on the one hand, Roshanara Begum on the other, and their niece, Zebo Nisa. Because most of the time, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, much of the, the, the philosophical discourse, the theological discourse, and also the historical analysis has been around Akbar, pre-Akbar, post-Akbar, to an extent Majale Sija Hungary, and to an extent, or at least two, three generations down the line, how does that affect Dara Shikho? How does that impact him? How does that shape his philosophical or mystical output? But very, very few people have concentrated on the women of the, of the imperial palace. And this is something that you've done beautifully. I want you to share with our viewers what your findings are. Yeah, I mean, yes. I mean, in fact, you know, I worked and I... Uh, I feel that I worked really very hard, and uh, I could not have, of course, covered the, all the princes, Mughal princes, uh, in India. That is from Gulbadan Begum down to uh, Zebun Nessa. Uh, uh, but I, in fact, and I selected only the princes who saw Aurangzeb's time, and also because you can see what why I did so, and also who were contemporaries of Dara Shikho and Aurangzeb. So I mean, my interest in Dara Shikho and Aurangzeb, you can see this. So uh, yes, uh, since I, I, in my understanding, Mughal politics, you cannot appreciate Mughal politics if you do not uh, do the Sufi politics or the Sufi Taskiras closely. Uh, and since Mughal politics is in fact not related, limited only to the male apartments, to the main court, the Mughal politics was also very much, in fact, formulated, shaped, and revised inside the haram. Therefore, I thought that I should certainly discuss, at least, you know, briefly, the haram politics and, and the Sufi relationship. You know, I do not have to, in fact, go into the details that the Mughal princes, right from Timur's time, they had their own wives, 
uh, in fact, uh, my friend reminds me of the, even the subaltern speaks this article by uh, Gayatri Spivak. So they had their own wife, Timur's wife. In fact, she would organize the parties of drinking parties to the ambassadors on their on her own, where you do not have even Timur. And when Shah Rukh Mirza died, Shah Rukh Mirza's queen, in fact, she in fact, took care of managing the state and inviting the nobles and the princess. And so, so there is a tradition and, uh, of interference, very, very evident interference from the Haram. And you have in India, of course, Gulbadan Begum, and much more than Gulbadan Begum, in fact, uh, Maryam Zamani in Akbar's time. And also you have the much more, well, I do not have to give the details, Noor Jaha, to the extent that Noor Jaha Junta, you know, you have that, it was primarily Noor Jaha who was the ruler. Uh, Jahagir's interest was primarily just, you know, to relax and drink and poetry and literature. So, uh, so, so therefore I do not have to establish first that how much the Mughal princes were involved in politics and in forming and in shaping the politics. So I took, in fact, three princes primarily. And, and in fact, uh, and the reason, of course, is that all these three princes in one way or the other, in my understanding, have not been given due attention. I start with Jahanara. Jahanara, of course, you have several writings right from the late 19th century on Jahanara. And even today, recently, a couple of uh, biographies uh, monographs on Jahanara, but Jahanara's primary text in which you have the personality of Jahanara reflected and in which you have his her sophistic claims and claims, of course, of her, in fact, role in, in the Timurid dynasty, that is Sahibiya, a kind of uh, autobiographical account. This has not been properly analyzed. So I thought that I should read it closely. So I started, of course, with Jahanara's writings, uh, her letters to Aurangzeb and the politics, etc. 27, 28 letters uh, to Aurangzeb and thereby how it in fact reflects and gives you an idea of the nature of conflict with, between Aurangzeb and the court, which was dominated according to Aurangzeb's understanding by Dara Shiko because of Dara Shiko being so close to Shah Jahan. Uh, I then came to Sahibiya. And in Sahibiya, I analyze Sahibiya very closely. And three things, in fact, comes out from my reading of Jahanara, which is, in fact, very significant. First, that Jahanara calls herself that she was direct disciple of Khwaja Munizun Chishti. Jahanara lived in the 17th century, Khwaja Munizun Chishti lived in late uh, centuries in 12th ago. century, 400 yes. years earlier. Now, this is, in fact, in Sufi uh, terminology, this is called Ovaisiyat, uh, you know, and this, in fact, uh, relates to Khaja uh, Ovais Karni, who could not, in fact, meet the Prophet, but accepted Islam and Prophet appreciated uh, his, because of his mother's illness, etc. So, uh, so anybody who does not have, in fact, the direct, you know, Mushahada, direct meeting with the master, but still the master is guiding him or her is Ovaisi. So she calls herself Ovaisi. Every, I mean, let me use this, in fact, common parlance uh, expression. Every Tom, Dick and Harry cannot claim that he is an Ovaisi, yes. even amongst the Sufis. If he or she claims that he will be laughed at, you know, here, Jahanara is taken very seriously, as we know. So, that is direct, it. so it's like a direct personal relationship with that master. With the, with the master, and it's not an ordinary master. It's, he is, in fact, the greatest of the master, Chisti masters yes. in India. In fact, yeah, I mean, to, to the extent that he's called even the nabi -e hind the prophet of India. So, so this is one. The second thing is that he, she eventually, in fact, becomes, she is in search of uh, the living peer, and she looks for some Chishtis. She's not satisfied. She looks also for, for some Qadri. By this time, the Qadris are very much prominent in, yes. in Mall India. And finally, she gets, of course, at the advice of he, her brother, to whom he was very close, uh, uh, Dara Shiko. I will not, uh, in fact, emphasize that how much she is in love with Dara Shiko. Uh, she, she likes Dara Shiko as a scholar. She likes Dara Shiko as a Sufi. So, uh, she, but she says expressly 
that she would herself in fact check and test whether he deserves to be her master her which is unheard master. of right which is unimaginable which, is, which which by by a woman of all the person by a woman the third thing which is more important is that finally she because she all the time she is very much anxious to know more about you know uh, this is uh, mulla shabadakshi who was of course dara shikos uh, piro murshid yes. and finally she saw in dream prophet muhammad along with the companions and it is not the first time of course only prophet muhammad and his companions second time he also she also saw prophet muhammad and sitting at his feet mulla shabadakshi now this in fact and then prophet muhammad instructing mulla shabadakshi which implies that you have in fact been a master of this time or something why don't you integrate her also and this will illumine the dynasty now so she in fact the image self image is that now that it is not simply at dara shikos in fact advice but she got instructions and direction okay. direct from the prophet direct which is not an ordinary position even for a for a pious muslim let alone uh, you know of course i mean i'm not uh, meaning denigrations let alone for a woman so so this is the second thing third is that even after she became a disciple of mulla shah badakhshi she when she visits the shrine of khaja mohammad uh, mohammad or khaja mohammadin chishti the the kind of the language that she uses is in fact to be noted which shows that she so simultaneously with two peers yes. that is also that's very rare in fact that is allowed in certain circumstances but that is very rare and and funny you know that she desired that she should be buried she in the be buried of khaja nizamuddin aliya so and, that and, is muzaffar ji muzaffar ji just anecdotally even earlier when she, she she was you know badly burnt in that accident and she was recovering there was there are periods of time where she would actually go to a missionary for she would be uh, at at the shrine of of uh, khwaja chishti yes yes. Was, yes yeah so and so the time the she was of already course. a disciple of of mulla shah but even then when she had the even accident then, and she was recovering then. and she, you know so, she would she would spend time there at the, at the shrine he is simultaneously a adri and a chishti which is very chishti. rare that position you cannot accord even to the greatest of the great princes who claim to be the greatest of the great sufis that is dara shikho you know i'll come to this point that how dara shikho in fact considered to be the highest even amongst the sufis of his time and uh, uh, not and power combining political power and and spiritual truth so uh, so this is in fact interesting uh, in her case that shows her confidence that shows you know her and in fact you know Uh, she in fact mentioned rabia basriya one of the undisputed in fact masters sufi masters women sufi masters of early islam and implication is that she herself is the rabia basriya of her own time so i would not go into in fact the verses that she is also a poet not of course a major poet uh, like her uh, niece zebun nisa uh, so this is one the second in fact the second princess that i selected is uh, roshanara or roshan rai you know that about roshan rai from the european account that for from european accounts about all the princes but about roshan rai roshan ara in particular you know the debauchery that she would not be satisfied and that she sleeps with a one man or two men uh, in the same night etc or in the political chronicles that you have she is in fact projected as somebody very close to aurangzeb virtually spying for aurangzeb agent of aurangzeb in the court and she is a rival of jahanara uh, she 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 is she does she hates uh, dara shikho which is of course you know correct and in fact uh, she took initiative in dara shikho's execution uh, you know after uh, aurangzeb came to power and or at best the expression will be that the nobles would come to her uh, palace aurangzeb in fact awarded him uh, very you know generously after he came to power and she in fact demonstrated her power like a real powerful prince you know these things you have but nowhere you have any hint of her association with the spirituality so that is in fact perhaps i have not read 
I am the first person. I may be absolutely. Maybe there will be questions and objections. I am the first person to show her as the real Nakshbandi Mujaddidi saint of her own time, and the kind of the letters that she writes. Not simply that the Nakshbandi Mujaddidi saint Khaja Saifuddin, who was deputed to take care of the royal haram and royal court by his father Sheikh Muhammad Masum Sarandi, but also the letters. With, and the kind of the questions that she raises in her letters to or of course it's not her letters but the saint of course repeats whatever she had written the let the question that she asks shows a very high stature in his spirituality and and the second thing is that you know uh, i would not go into these details how did she die but the uh, her connections with of course not Khaja Masum Sarandi has been shown even by some of our architecture historian uh, that the the tomb of Khaja Masum Sarandi was financed and built and supervised by 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 uh, Roshanara and in fact you have the evidence of and manifestations of the Mughal architecture Mughal style of decorations in Khaja Masum's uh, uh, of tomb in Sarand but you know uh, the stature that you get. in the nakshbandi text of her is higher even even higher than her sister jahanara jahanara nowhere jahanara claims that she is a khalifa that she can also initiate khalifa means that a disciple who has been permitted by the master to behave like a master and to initiate the others She so no we are for fakira right she calls yeah. herself fakira ha huh. of course i mean fakira of course this is a like darvesh you know i'm yes uh, you know, uh, yes even otherwise she was the fakira richest. is being humble right you know no yes. way you're humble. saying you're yes. a master it's humble yes yeah and in fact even if she was the richest princess of her time and yes. aurangzeb in, in fact yes yes aurangzeb allowed in fact all the jagirs that she had all the properties that she had to remain with her and she lived in fact a very beautiful palace in delhi so yes so but this roshanara in fact is allowed to behave like a real spiritual master khalifa in mujaddidi nakshbandi sarhandi traditions for the women inside the haram no that is that's something which nobody has in fact noted maybe that because people thought that these are just the 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 ranks of of the sufi saints but this shows actually the sufi nakshbandi sarhandi mujaddidi sufi once they get access to the court of aurangzeb their yes. effort and their ambitions to get access inside the haram in order yes. to completely completely sure. cover monopolize okay. monopolize yes. their their monopolize. sovereignty their, their, monopolize. their power and, right their grip yes. their control and you have the manifestations of this kind of relationship with aurangzeb of the mujaddidi nakshbandi sarhandi sarhandi mujaddidi nakshbandi in the politics of the time in the politics of the 18th century and uh, you know including of course the decline and the alienations of the of 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 the non muslims uh, of course i mean it's not alienation in the sense as many people would think the rajput are still fighting with aurangzeb but we know that rajputs were not very happy with aurangzeb and 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 of all in fact the imposition of jizya you know which is so the hated jizya because there is no justification even in islamic sharia but according to these one or the other sunni tradition perhaps you know at least to humiliate if nothing else to humiliate so that is you know these are the two especially in fact posts that were created in aurangzeb's time muhtasib and also amile jizya the collect amine jizya yes so that is uh, and the third of course Uh, is Zebunnisa, you know, I I give a special attention to Zebunnisa, primarily for two reasons. One that I am very much fascinated by her poetry, which of course is considered to be in fact fake, at least not uh, every ghazal, but at least the Diwan, that particular volume of uh, which is known as Diwan e Mahfi, uh, mm-hmm. because her pen name is uh, Mahfi. Tahallus is Mahfi. so uh, i wanted to in fact see what is her evaluations in amongst her contemporaries so i selected first of course her own mentor and tutor 
uh, Ashraf Mazandran, an Iranian, one of the major poets of the 17th century, who has a divan. And I just went through, uh, browsed through the poems which were which he wrote for uh, Zibun Nisa, and which were or which were dedicated or which had one or the other connection in terms of the events which took place and where Zibun Nisa figured, and the kind of the adjectives that he uses. I will not go into the details. You know, I suggest that she is highly talented. She has one of the best literate. She is also a poet. And, and there is a poem which in, also hints that perhaps her own divan was in fact drawn uh, because of the error of one of uh, her uh, you know, mates uh, in, in, the, in the pond, in the house, uh, or in the tank. And that is also interesting because each and every word that could have been, uh, could have meant for Ashraf Mazandarani, how he describes that. So that is, then in fact, you know, that there were several mafis, the general understanding among the historians. And this, of course, came out from our great uh, Jadunas Sarkar because he, like a real, uh, you know, Rankian, he right. said that, First time you have evidence of uh, Zebun Nisa being, in fact, uh, uh, a, a poet with the name of Mahfi or Tahalus of Mahfi. Decades. 16, oh, 70 yes. years in the yes. in the Taskara of uh, Bhagwan Das uh, Hindi, Bhagwan Das uh, Hindi, which is called Taskara Hindi, or there you have a paragraph, or in uh, Gulerana of Lachmirana and Shafi. There is no evidence from her own time. Mm -hmm. But here is a person, in fact, one, of course, Ashraf Mazandrani himself. But the fact that her name, pen name was Mahfi, comes out Mahfi. so clearly from a few lines of Marcia mourning that elegy that uh, a, a Mughal official wrote, his name is Champatrai, and he also was tutored and uh, and his poetry was corrected by Ashraf Mazandarani. He was also one of the peoples of Ashraf Mazandarani. And he, you have, in fact, the manuscript, uh, these manuscripts of these lines, and also the letters that he exchanged after the death of, of Princess uh, Zibun Nisa with uh, Ashraf Mazandarani, who had left by this time for Iran. He himself died, actually, this Ashraf Mazandarani in 1704. And there you have you know, the, he's playing with the word Mahfi and is clearly, and he also, in fact, described, uses an expression, Khusruve Mulke Sohan, in the country, in the domain of the speech, in the domain of poetry, she was the king. Now, how can you call anyone, you know, the king of, or, you know, of the domain of speech of, and poetry, poetry, if she or he is not, uh, and a complete poet uh, who could have so therefore i think that is did divani mahfi it is possible that there may have been some interpolations there mm -hmm. may have been some ghazals or some poems by some other poets but several poems from the spirit from the the from the content of the poems and the spirit of the poem you can guess that would have come from zebun nisa because zebun nisa does not approve of also aurangzeb's politics because if she was the dear daughter of her father, and uh, if she would be accompanying her father everywhere that you know Aurangzeb would go, she was eventually imprisoned because of her suspected association with Muhammad Akbar, who rebelled against, yes. against, against Aurangzeb uh, because of Aurangzeb's, in fact, you know, indifference at least, if not uh, hostility to to Rajputs, and and in fact one of the interpretations of Aurangzeb's leaving Delhi is that he left Delhi chasing Muhammad Akbar. And you know that in uh, Mughal chronicles after Muhammad Akbar's uh, rebellion, uh, his name is given Abtar. That is the one who has been, who has gone down, who has been uh, insulted and humiliated. Uh, who yes. And, and I was just wondering, right? I mean, would it be fair so, to say that that's so philosophically I, yes, so I, would, I would sum up this part mm -hmm. that you know uh, i have not of course established that she is the author of this divan divan mm -hmm. but i mm -hmm. certainly believe that she is one of the a major eminent poets of her time 
she is one of the highly literate and talented persons and it's not that she patronize it's not that she patronize only uh, she patronize uh, the compilations of several important books like zebut tafasir the persian version of one of the greatest in fact quranic commentaries by imam razi uh, fakhruddin imam razi's tafsir e kabir which is called zebut tafasir she uh, patronize and funded one of uh, her own associates to go to makka and write about his travel which is the first of its kind from india anisul hujjaj so she is not simply that she is a great scholar of her time she is one of the great poets of her time and but she suffered at the hands of aurangzeb and therefore i chose in fact in this article one ghazal which in fact uh, you know suggests that how she is different from aurangzeb how she is actually addressing her own father from uh, from prison and uh, yeah there are Rafaji, on that particular ghazal, do you have the the Persian original with you right now? Would you like to no, read out? No, uh, I do not have because I do not have Divan with me. So I'm okay. sorry, I do not have. Yes. Okay. So that is so, that is, yeah. And and the thing is that you know, uh, Aurangzeb. I mean, as I told you, that Aurangzeb is very fond of. He may or may not have been completely associated with only Naqshbandi, Mujaddidi, but his orientation by temperament. He, temperament is the same as any mujaddidi naqshbandi sheikhs and he is a dry sharia man dry theologian sharia man and therefore he encouraged and and fund, funded fatah uh, alamgiri etc fiqh he is interested in fiqh uh, even if he violated the fiqh we, when he reimposed the jizya uh, he violated the fiqh he did not act according to the fiqh but you know the thing is that he all the time aspires that all the members of the family should be associated with the mujaddidi sarandi and he also asked the mujaddidi sarandi sheikhs to persuade when she is in prison in delhi and he is in the dakan to persuade zibun nisa as i will understand to in fact forgive uh, to be to seek forgiveness of her father and and but you know uh, zibun nisa of course would would retort back to the letters that she got from one of the major naqshbandi in fact that is also very interesting uh, he, his name is sheikh abdul ahad wahdat who himself is a persian poet and he also wrote in hindavi and his hindavi pen name is gul which means flower and he, he we have a couple of you know, three four letters of him which is full of in fact very literary very difficult language very literary very poetic and where again uh, he hints that you are a poet therefore you should understand and of course the discussion is not about her politics or aurangzeb's politics the discussion is on what in fact pathos is what gham is and that is of course pure literary discussion so this all this shows uh, that aurangzebun nasas is zebun nasas is teacher and it also shows and therefore i emphasize this and i took particular interest in these letters it also shows that amongst the naqshbandis also you do not have simply the pure sharia oriented sufi uh, sufis sharia oriented yes but there are also poets and figures of uh, uh, men of literature whose influence because of whose influence or because of whose association with the literary figures of delhi in the 18th century you have in fact you know the naqshbandi naqshbandi saints uh, naqshbandi doctrine naqshbandi orientation of sharia very much in 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 vogue in delhi uh, even if there are of course uh, variations accommodations revision like for instance uh, sheikh uh, mirza mazhar jan janan who is a naqshbandi mujaddidi but you know the story and i would not repeat this story that you know how he in fact uh, He, he projects lord krishna or lord rama when a dream uh, is uh, related in in the khanqa of his master sufi master and who thinks that you know this is of course that rama and lord krishna they are in the fire and so the fire is interpreted as hell fire and lord krishna is in the middle of the hell fire and rama is on the um, sitting on the margins and this one fellow says that this is the hell fire then mirza mazhar janan would say no 
this is not hellfire this is the fire of love and the love of course is divine love and mm -hmm. lord krishna in fact represents the depth of divine love while rama of course has also many other concern so you know there are of course and changes and even in nakshbandi silsila i have shown it in the introduction i did not discuss it primarily in any chapter uh, later in the 19th century and even early 20th century you have some saints sufi saints who are non who remain hindu despite the fact that the sufi wanted that now i should accept islam because i believe in these social and spiritual practices of the nakshbandi silsila so the master said no and this is this in fact you can connect to mirza mazhar janjana through bahrai's uh, line i do not remember all the details so yeah so this is what i would say in response very briefly yes uh, murafa ji there is another theme that we absolutely have to explore without which this discussion would be incomplete because we talked about jan ara begum roshan ara begum zebunisa we've talked about uh, from babar to akbar definitely a great depth on all of it we haven't as yet spoken about darashiko and that is is absolutely critical for this discussion because i i personally when i read it in my humble opinion it is easily the most imaginative and the most astute of of all the essays and and of of many such essays that i would have read and and i'm sure many of the viewers once they read the book or whoever has read the book would would agree with me because for generations for generations you know from the time of his panegyrist abul fazl up way into you know maybe until this point right there has hardly been any disputation there's been a lot of disputation about akbar's politics but hardly any disputation that when it comes to the pluralistic syncretic ethos of mughal history or the entire islamic period amongst monarchs amongst sultans akbar is at the pinnacle and what your analysis what your research shows is not a, a not just a very very keen an observant analysis or examination of the evolution of darashiko as a scholar as a theologist as a chronicler as a philosopher but also comparing i wouldn't use the word contrast but comparing his ideas and his framework if i may use the term of political kingship and comparing that with that of akbar so if you would share with us your your findings particularly in the context of of the translation uh, from the sanskrit of yog vashisht yeah so this is an interesting question and this is something which i did and i also in fact uh, rather arrogantly i thought that perhaps the earlier uh, analysts and earlier uh, essays on yoga vashishta uh, did not take into considerations something very important in the persian yoga vashishta and particularly of uh, darashikos which in fact we have in darashiko the the first thing in fact i must make it absolutely clear that i do not contrast uh, and uh, maybe that you know i have used some words which uh, might be giving this impression i do not say that darashiko is ahead of you know after all darashiko lived in fact so many years so many decades after uh, akbar and darashiko is in akbari line in akbari line so he must of course if he is bright if he is intelligent if he thinks about the society and environment around him uh, close you know seriously then he he must be in fact suggesting so therefore of course in this respect he is certainly ahead of akbar and in the second thing is uh, that uh, that i feel that darashiko you know i in fact i started that why darashiko is keen to retranslate yoga vashishta because by the time darashiko was there you know you have several translations of yoga vashishta yoga vashishta of course lagu yoga vashishta not of course the brahad yoga vashishta but but uh, he is dissatisfied yes the first one of course is you know nizam panipatis which was commissioned in akbar's time and which was very closely supervised by jahangir and mm -hmm. and then but that is and then second of course is uh, abul qasim fendersky uh, there are several but these two abul qasim fendersky of course is a kind of essay and he he analyzes he does not in fact follow each and every word and he integrates several verses 
in the interpretation he writes extremely beautiful prose which in fact is very uh, very uh, in, in intoxicating and then you have also the summarized version of yoga vashishta uh, as a book of pure book of tasavvuf by sufi qutb jahani uh, sufi qutb jahani which is called hallul asrar atwar dar hall asrar which is not of course even log lagu yoga vashishta it is para, because it, in this you have 10 chapters while in lagu yoga vashishta you have 6 chapters para. so uh that could be in fact uh, yoga vashishta sar or something based on yoga vashishta sar. but you know darashiko in fact he plans he invites uh, the brahmans of his time uh, you know and he he plans to have his own translation why my feeling is that darashiko saw that something very critical is there in lobhu yoga vashishta in yoga vashishta sorry in yoga vashishta which has been missed out and what is that that yoga vashishta is not simply a book on tasavvuf a book on vedant a book on philosophy you know the philosophy you know pure spiritualism is and it does not represent simply spiritual truth the lagu yoga vashishta the yoga vashishta also has a full discussions about what should be the state craft what should be the nature of political management what is the ideal of governance in particular of course and there he becomes particularly interested because he is also aspiring to become ruler he is also because he is you know you know that he in, engaged in the battle of uh, uh, you know succession battle so so he and then he sees also something and uh, that is of course uh, and therefore uh, he and this kind of comes out this particular message that this is something which has been missed out right at the beginning of uh, the translation which is attributed to darshiko which was in fact supervised or advised you know by darshiko yes. i mean i won't go into the details how much he he knew sanskrit and whether he is direct translator or he simply edited and certainly mm-hmm. edited and supervised that is two things one right at the beginning there is a question by bhardwaj to to valmiki and the question in the question is that if ram is such a high figure in his spirituality then how is it that he managed the sultanat it's only in ragu in in yoga vash sorry in darashiko's translation that the word sultanat right at the beginning in fact uh, the first chapter you have in fact this expression so that is so the entire book then is in fact a kind of solution a kind of analysis of what should be the best way of blending the political power the, with, the with, political, yes. with the spiritual truth the spiritual mm-hmm. truth so that is one and the second story is also important even if this is not as you know expanded as nizam panipati's translation which is word to word of lagu vishista but he gives the story he in fact picks up from the other important brahmanical text and he gives the story particularly at the beginning of the confrontation between uh, between vishwamitra and and vashishta muni that's very important and vishwamitra in fact you know that vishwamitra actually visited and he wanted no uh he wanted uh, raja ramchandra prince ramchandra to mm. to come to the rescue of uh, of of the sages in the jungle uh, who are being in fact uh, uh, troubled by by the demons and mm-hmm. and then of course uh, you know i mean i won't go into the detail and then of course uh, he meets vashishta muni and he reminds him of brahma's brahma's solutions of the problems that he had faced once and that then it comes the kamdenu story that you know because vishwamitra is a prince he is a raja and he comes to vashishtamuni and vashishtamuni invites him and he is very he gets very jealous that how it is that you know he he is just an ordinary brahman and he and so he wants to become like vashishtamuni yes. so uh, so uh, Uh, and then he he realizes one of his in fact associates suggests that it is all because of kamdenu <laughs> so he took kamdenu 
and come down with and complains to vashist muni that uh, why are you in fact you know allowing me or allowing him to take me then vashist muni says that you know i'm i'm helpless i don't want you to go but he is he has forced me to take you so then come down who says that okay i will manage and then you know the story that each the drop of soviet of kamdenu would in fact create one strong man and finally the strong army and uh, vishwamitra who was then only a king was completely defeated and then he again came and he was defeated so finally he thought that he should so he 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 should be a brahman so brahman has greater power you know that is something very interesting this is story at the beginning is very interesting uh which figures only in darashiko's translation and then so he should become brahma but then of course brahma comes and brahma says okay you combine a chatriya and brahman both so so raja plus uh, rishi so rajarshi yeah. but he is not ha huh, rajarshi you will become rajarshi but he is not satisfied even with that finally he becomes a real you know uh brahman and he becomes vishwamitra so he reminds vashist muni to repeat the same message or the you know nasihat that was given to him by what was the nasihat nasihat was that you can become a good brahman and still you can become a good statesman a good king that is what in fact the entire discussions in 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 yoga vashista is so darashiko reads yoga vashista as a kind of political treatise as a kind the same kind of political treatise uh, or ethical political ethics treatise as the earlier moguls or even before the moguls the muslims persho islamic world muslims had seen in say uh, uh, aristotle's nikomachia which in fact you have a manifestation of it or summary of it in uh, nasiruddin tusi is akhlaq e tusi or uh, jalaluddin dawani is akhlaq e jalali or uh, uh, husain wise kashfi is akhlaq e mohsini so and the akbar's in fact ambitions would be you know right from babar to akbar in fact that is i'm referring to akhlaq e uh, akhlaq e husain perhaps yes, this call akhlaq e husaini uh oh ikhtiyar e husaini is summary of uh, and particular because in the in such text you have a chapter on mamlikat dari on political management on state craft and at best or at worst you would find that in akbar's time uh, with the advice of course with the, of his primary ideologue abul fazal he in fact is looking you know the political norms uh, i won't say beyond sharia but in addition to sharia in order to in fact manage the different communities the interest of the different communities different ethnic groups that is the maximum and this has been in fact a trend in fact a part of a tradition of the mogal jahangir also in fact uh, to him was uh, dedicated this uh, summary translations uh, of the roman and greco uh, hellenic rulers uh, ethical and political ethics by jerome xavier which is called adab e sultan which is still to be published but we have uh, i have written an article on it with uh, sanjay subramaniam uh, i have in fact uh, and so that is uh, so that is one then even murad bakhsh uh, he looks for in fact the pattern of governance or the norms of governance in the pre islamic sassanid world and there is in fact a text uh, which is called tawqiat e kisravi and this was translated into arabic from pahlavi in earlier times and he wants this to be translated and he got it translated into mogal persian uh, under his supervision so you have in fact an urge and a curiosity uh, for looking for uh, the norms of governance which could be ideal for a society which is so multi ethnic so multicultural now but nobody in fact nor even akbar and here of course akbar got of course translation of uh, mahabharata commission of uh, one of the major books and several ramayana yes, yes. mahabharata but you do not have in fact any curiosity in uh, even akbar to look for ideals of governance in the uh, descriptions of the rulers in mahabharata 
Mm-hmm. That is mm-hmm. the description of the rulers who who ruled India before the coming of the Mughals, before the coming of Islam. Now, uh, here, Muzaffarji, uh, I'm just thinking here, Muzaffarji, would it be fair to say that in the case of Akbar, there is a political vision to harmonize the indigenous sects, the Rajput sects. So he was probably looking through translations to understand the culture rather than looking at a model or a framework of kingship based on which he would have the foundations of his rule. Yes, yes. This is what, in fact, I'm, you know, you have put it, in fact, in a very, you know, uh, succinct way. Yes, this is what I would like to you know. At that time, even until you know, the early years of Shah Jahan's time, you have the ambitions to to accommodate, to understand, to appreciate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But here in Darashiko, you have not simply appreciation. He had already shown the appreciation, in fact, yes. uh, to the extent that he saw many things similar in the Brahminical and Indic traditions. And then he, later on, he also translated uh, 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 yes, and yeah, yeah, I and mean, Upanishad, of course. Yes. So, uh, and besides, so I think that, you know, so here in this book, in fact, the what comes out that he is keen to understand what would be the ideal, what has been ideal. And in his understanding, the ideal is, of course, uh, the Raja Ramchandra. Raja Ramchandra is Bhagwan, he is Vishnu's representative Vishnu's avatara and he is also an ideal ruler and this you can see besides but of course Darashiko also appreciates his own stature you know when he describes the dream you he have in his dream in fact the younger brother yes and braided temporalities this yes. braided temporalities yes. he approves of the of the temporality which is the hallmark of the brahmanical tradition that they are still today so he said that they, yes, they live today and I am the person who had met them. And I have been blessed by, like Raja Ram Chandra, uh, as Vashist Muni is Raja Ram Chandra's master, Raja Ram Chandra's guru. So he is also, in fact, equally affectionate as any guru could be to me. And Raja Ram Chandra was instructed by, you know, his guru uh, that I should be given special, in fact, sweet meat. You know, yes. I should be yes. considered to be. So, and in this dream, it is interesting. He does not see Lachman. He sees Raja Ramchand. And so that is related to... He himself is Lachman because he himself yes. is the younger brother. Yes, he himself is. Yeah. So the only thing is that Lachman is not the ruler and he wants to become the ruler. And and he, he thinks that he has already achieved that kind of high spiritual position. Because when he was only 25, he heard this Hatif, the voice of the Hatif, angelic voice, that you have achieved a stature in spiritual, uh, in spirituality, which no other ruler had achieved in, before that. So, of course, tall claim, and which, of course, which is not my concern. My concern is where, in fact, their activities come uh, in the contact of the of average ordinary people like you and me. So. So this is this is in fact what I I thought I should say in brief in response to this question, and it's already in fact you know yeah I mean uh, we should be in fact considerate uh, and respectful to the time given to us. Yes, uh, yeah. we have a number of questions from the audience. As you can imagine, many of them we were we were you know uh, putting them displaying them on the screen, and it's not surprising that this has been such a, an astute, such a an in depth an engrossing conversation that many of these questions, uh, and, and that's something that I was noting in, in passing on the private chat, is many of these questions have in fact been answered already by you. What I would like to do is I'd like to take up a quick couple of questions before we conclude today's program. We'll start with Auditra's question. This has to do with you know the music and, and Sama. Uh, and yes, so his question is, as a Sufi Kawali or Sama, come to India through the Chistis or do we have other traditions, for example, Suravati? Yeah, besides the Chistis, we also have the Qadris, among the Qadris, but initially with the Chistis, because the Chistis, of course, came, Qadris came towards the end of the 16th century. Uh, Qadri order is widespread in the 17th century, but the Chistis, of course, is amongst the first together with mm-hmm. the Suravati who uh, 
uh, interred with Khwaja Mohyuddin Chishti. So, of course, and you have the debate about Sama as early as in the 14th century in Fatuh Salatin by Asami. Uh, you, very interesting, in fact, uh, debate and discussion between the Qazis on the one hand and the Sufi on the other hand. Uh, Sufi is, I think, Hamiduddin Nagori on the other hand. And this is called Mahzar and uh, supervised and uh, chaired by none other than the Sultan himself. So, so it is primarily uh, with the Chishtis, but mm -hmm. of course mm -hmm. later very much a part of. And in fact, it became also a part of the Naqshbandi uh, in a measure. Maybe in the 18th and towards late 18th and 19th yes, centuries. Yes, yes. So the amalgamation of the, the other. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, Rafaji, remind me and correct me if I'm wrong. I've the, I think the legend goes that there was a time when when Khwaja Mohyuddin uh, Nizamuddin Alia, sorry, Nizamuddin Alia was was very upset or he was depressed about about something, and and, and his disciple uh, Hazrat Amir Khusro goes to him, and it is at his behest that he invents it is it is the ijad of call or Kawali with the with the first song Kuntum Mola, and that is how Kawali comes into being. Is, is no, that, that is no, that, that is that is yeah. how no there in fact call becomes integrated into, but mm -hmm. bef mm -hmm. before that call that mm -hmm. what is called mankunto maula faali yo maula. Now this yes. particular call, which is of course uh, attributed to the prophet, uh, the last one of the last speeches of the prophet after yes. the last Hajj, and where he said in fact he raised the hand of Hazrat Ali. And he said, uh, Man Gunto Maula Fali O Maula. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and this is also being debated and discussed between the Sunnis and the Shias. I won't go into the details. But that call, because of that mm -hmm. call, this particular Sama then began to be called Qawwali. But Qawwali. earlier, before that, and that would be mm -hmm. true, Nizamuddin Aliya mm -hmm. is so close to, not simply, in fact, the call, Nizamuddin Aliya was also reported that. Uh, this is with reference to the Bagh Bahari story uh, that, you know, he, when he was taken ill, uh, Khusra, in fact, uh, invented or wrote this story and he would read out this story. This is in prose, of course, in suspense mm -hmm. with verses to Hazrat Nizamuddin Awliya and Hazrat Nizamuddin Awliya, of course, recovered. And then, recovered. of course, blessing is, blessing is that whosoever will read this will also be recovered from illness or ailment. So that is a different thing. That's just... You, at best, you can say that this is the second and more formalized and advanced stage of that. In Sama, you cannot mm -hmm. think of Sama after this unless you start with Qawl. But before that, of course, Sama would be even, you know, Sama could be just a ghazal of uh, any poet, Nizami or the earlier Persian poet, or even sometimes the Sama could be even the prose prose, you know, not necessarily the, because the Sama, the idea of Sama is that you get intoxicated by listening to the words which go into mm -hmm. your heart mm -hmm. and so. So that is, yes, that is true. That legend could be true. I would not dispute that. But, you know, the, the dispute and debate and record of Sama is even before that. And that is reported, in fact, in, in Fatuh Salatin, the first one. Okay. Wonderful. Um, so, uh, Rafaji, there is another question that I got on the chat box from, this is actually from Dipejda, and he wanted to understand from you, if you're looking at the legacy of the Sufis, or the Sufis in contemporary India, and I'm, and I'm expanding on that, so we go to the Dargah and Ajmer Sharif, or Fatehpur Sikri, or Nizamuddin Alia, and, and so many other places in, in Southeast Asia, how do you view the, the legacy of the Sufis? and their influence in the politics of contemporary India? Very difficult question. Very difficult question. You know, unless, you know, in fact, you know, this in part, the response to this question I have given in the introduction, the long history of Sufism and Indian Muslim political culture. Right from, if, if you go to Jahanara's time, then Sufis are considered to be really very powerful. So you cannot go ahead in any worldly things, worldly or other worldly, unless you are in association with one or the other Sufi. So your advisor is a Sufi. And uh, because in the life hereafter, you, you will be nowhere. 
if you are not under one or the other banner of one or the other Sufis. That is the belief. And then, of course, throughout, I mean, I have shown that how by the time of Sir Sayyid, Sir Sayyid initially, Sir Sayyid, the founder of Aligarh, initially, or founder of rationality, Muslim rationality or modernism and whatnot, you know, initially, he's so, in fact, uh, respectful and reverent to the Sufis of his, of his father. In fact, he mentioned that he himself grew in the laps of uh, of, of uh, one of the Sufis. I forget his name. You know who, whose disciple was his father. So you know, but the gradually he becomes quote unquote Wahhabi. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm using the modern term Wahhabi. That is, he questions the validity and. The one of the essays that I have cited in the introduction that he wrote, in fact, he literally, he literally, uh, you know, tamaskhur, you know, not simply sarcastic, he laughs at whatever the Sufis claim in terms of his spirituality and in terms he's, of something. He's, he's mocking, he's mocking yeah, their mocking, philosophy. Mocking at what, what yes. you have said in Mokashfa or, 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 or Epiphanies. So mm -hmm. that is what, in fact, the modern Muslim is. But then you recover, in fact, in Iqbal's poetry, in Iqbal's poetry. And Iqbal, of course, is the leader of the Muslim mind, at least, Muslim thought and Muslim mind in the early 20th century. So, you know, that, but the result is that the Sufis, despite the fact that Ashraf Ali Thani is such a great scholar, Maulana Hussain Ahmad Madani is a great, but he is a great because he is in part, participating in politics. He is not great because he's a, a, he's a Sufi. So, so the thing is that that power, that mundane power or political power that you would in fact believe in the Sufis, that belief in fact gradually got eroded in course of time. And today, even I could be, you know, suspect that, you know, whatever, you know, that you have in the political, even in the political chronicles or mm -hmm. Shah Jahan's dream of Khaja Muhammad Khaja Khizr alias. Okay. In fact, where is that? In fact, where is that? So in such a situation, that political power, which in fact was associated, which is associated in Mughal times with a Sufi is lost. Now, if it is lost, then people would hardly listen to him. So mm -hmm. therefore, I mean, it's the question of, but there are individuals. But as an institution, on both the political institutions and, of course, on the other hand, the spiritual, you know, Sufis institutions, the Jamaat -e Sufia. There is a Jamaat -e Sufia in India, but who listened to Jamaat -e Sufia? Of course, Modi initially, even Modi, went there and he uh, he gave a speech, and and uh, the political uh, figures are shown, you know, uh, presenting chador, uh, mm -hmm. that flower. Uh, on the but you know it's not like uh, even Akbar because whatever Akbar in fact uh, you know donated to shrine is still it is shown that that big piece of the diamond in the or uh, is you know a he studied in in fact that is in the grave of Khaja uh, Chishti. so this is how I will respond yeah. no so today no. Yeah, that, that, that the importance, the relevance of it, but, the immediacy yes, of it is. is but important. relevance, of course, I would think that mm -hmm. today, in relations to the, in relations to the, uh, Malvis and Mullahs, I would, as a student of history and as somebody who is, of course, Muslim and who has done theology and who has done a bit of Sufi studies, I would think that the Sufis would lead you to a better path than if he's not very much under the influence of uh, of uh, of the new modern chisti sufi because modern chisti sufi in fact i have discussed that chisti sufi also became completely transformed in the early 18th century there is no uh, sama in the in the literate in the literate part of the chisti sufi then the like Maulana Ashraf Ali Thanvi, he's one of the greatest Chishti Sufis of, of the 20th century, but he would not approve of Sama. Well, of course, Sama is there in Nizamuddin Awliya. Which is, so, which, is, which is so interesting, right? So in the earlier times, the Naqshbandis, through the 17th century, there is no Sama. 18th and 19th century, there is Sama. Yes. Throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, up until then, the Chishtis, you know, Sama is an integral part, and after that, there is no Sama. So it's, it's like a reversal. Yeah, in fact, you know, this... This, in fact, you know, I haven't uh, read the details, but this is in terms of the individuals, the institution. As an institution, mm -hmm. it gets weakened. 
so it is the individual which individual is in position in which time at which time in which group of the sufis okay. so this, Rupa, this is this has been an absolutely wonderful conversation and of course i have a vested interest whenever i talk to you i learn so much and i take away so much and i'm sure this has been a, an absolute delight for all the viewers who have been tuning in i want to thank you very much on behalf of the, the uh, university of chicago center in delhi on behalf of prohor on behalf of all of the the viewers uh, and listeners all your readers and your followers thank you so very much uh, adab and for viewers uh, please stay tuned in we'll be back again next month with another engrossing it so thank you very much and, uh, and thank you very much for the patience generous words i didn't have time to thank him and your generous words and the questions and the time and i'm so sorry and this is what in fact i'm i'm still in 17th century and this is my historical imagination that despite being 21st century i do not trust much technology so how it is at but of course you know you are in the 21st century if one failed the other one came to your rescue exactly so i'm Indeed. so sorry because of no no no, no. It, this, this, this is being wonderful yeah thank you was a okay.